Good morning, friends. Well, it's morning here. I'm not sure what time it is where you are. Uh, I've often made the argument that the biggest barrier that we have to addressing educational outcome inequalities really isn't practical strategies, that we have a lot of people with a lot of practical strategies. The problem, as I see it, is not the lack of practical strategies or the lack of people who want to create more equity and equality. The problem instead is an ideological problem. In other words, the, the, the issue is a lack of understanding about the complexity of inequalities. And as a result, there are a lot of people developing strategies based on misunderstandings of inequalities. And that is no path to the elimination of those inequalities and things like educational outcome gaps. So what I want to talk about is the ideological aspect of this. I want to talk about, in my work with schools, the three dominant ideologies that are driving conversations about uh, equity and social justice in schools. Because ultimately, it's the ideology, the, what we understand and what we believe about why the inequalities exist that drive the strategies that we can imagine and develop in response to those inequalities. So if our ideology is misinformed, then our responses are going to be misinformed and we'll stay in the cycle of inequality. So I want to talk about what I've seen working with schools is that the three dominant models or the three dominant ideological viewpoints when it comes to the way schools are talking about and dealing with uh, inequality. So there, are the, the three that I'm going to talk about are deficit ideology, grit ideology, which is kind of the new ideology on the block when it comes to dealing with uh, educational inequality, and then structural ideology. And my argument is basically going to be that we got to make our way to structural ideology, and there's no other way to do this. Uh, it, there's no other way to get us closer to equity and justice in schools. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about each of these, and I'll give some examples and, and talk about the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of starting with that ideology. So the first one, as I mentioned, is uh, deficit ideology. Deficit ideology, more or less, is the idea that if you could think about any sort of uh, power hierarchy, so just think I'm just drawing a little pyramid with my fingers here. So the idea of, of deficit ideology is that the people who are at the bottom of the power pyramid are there because of their own deficiencies. So people who are in poverty are in poverty because of deficiencies in people who are in poverty. So it's based on all these stereotypes and assumptions, for instance, none of which are true, by the way, for instance, that people in poverty are lazy, which never made sense to me because the people in poverty in my own family were coal miners. These are not lazy people. Uh, people in poverty generally work the most laborious jobs, uh, uh, the, and and also uh, in, the, in the U.S. at least, research shows that uh, working, uh, uh, low-income working adults work more hours on average per week than their wealthier peers. So uh, it's generally based on these sort of stereotypes, and uh, the, the the function of deficit ideology is to always have us looking down that, that pyramid, down the power continuum, to blame uh, the, the people with the least amount of power for the, the way, in the way we define the problem, instead of looking up the power continuum and saying, how are people with the power to create the structures creating it in ways that might be more or less accessible to people, uh, depending on their, their uh, level of access and opportunity. Uh, in order to be a deficit ideologue, in other words, in order to believe that people who are uh, the lowest achievers in school are the lowest achievers just because of deficiencies in those people, I have to ignore all kinds of structural inequalities. I have to ignore 
poverty. For instance, in, in, in order to make the argument that people in poverty are in poverty because of their own deficiencies, I have to blame, I, I have to completely ignore, in order to blame them, I have to completely ignore a whole host of things. I have to ignore, for instance, that low-income people don't have access to the same quality of health care, that they don't have access to the same, uh, uh, to, um, he as healthy foods. They don't have access to jobs that pay uh, a living wage. Uh, so I have to completely ignore all of those things in order to make this argument. But the reason that that works and the reason why we're socialized to have deficit ideology is it protects the interests of the people at the top of the power hierarchy because it never encourages us to ask how they benefit from the conditions uh, that, that uh, exists. So deficit ideology is about fixing people who are marginalized rather than fixing the conditions that marginalized people. I'll give you a quick story to illustrate this. I was doing some work with a school in Virginia, which is a state, uh, for those of you who aren't in the U.S., which is a state on the East Coast of the United States. And the dean of students called me up and said, we're having some problems here with race and we really want you to come in and uh, help us. So I came in to meet with the dean of students. He's the most well-intentioned guy you can imagine. And I said, okay, tell me what the issue is. And so he waves me down the hallway and swings open the, the doors of the cafeteria. And in this school, which is a fairly racially diverse school, there are a lot of Korean immigrants. And so there's a table right in front of us with a group of Korean immigrants. And then off to the left, there are two tables with African-American students. Uh, and the dean of students says, the problem here is that the students of color segregate themselves. So he points to the Korean students and the African-American students and says the students of color segregate themselves. So I look up and say, see that there's the Korean students, the African-American students. There's about 20 tables of all white students. And I say, well, it looks to me like the white students are segregating themselves. And his response was, you know, I've never seen it that way. And I said, aha, there's the challenge because he had always seen it through this deficit lens. If students of color aren't getting along well in school, aren't doing well in school, it must be something wrong with students of color. And so he's trained to see that, so he can't even see the bigger context that's happening at that school. And that's deficit ideology. It's about fixing marginalized communities rather than fixing the conditions that marginalize marginalized communities. And we can never get to equity that way. So there's a measuring stick for your equity and diversity initiatives. Are they about fixing marginalized people or are they about fixing within your institution, within your society, the conditions that marginalize people? So that's ideology number one. Ideology number two it's called grit ideology. That's kind of the new ideology on the block when it comes to equity and diversity. Unlike deficit ideology, grit ideology acknowledges that there are barriers, acknowledges that there are inequalities. So it might acknowledge, for instance, that, uh, that low-income students have uh, less access to, uh, to uh, libraries or less access to uh, safe uh, and affordable housing or, or whatever the inequalities are. But grit ideology, rather than addressing those inequalities and trying to eliminate them, grit ideology is about how do I recognize the inequalities exist and then help make students who are marginalized more resilient or gritty against those inequalities. So in that sense, grit ideology is really a kind of deficit ideology. Grit ideology basically is still about fixing marginalized communities, even though there's a recognition of the existence of, of, uh, of inequality. So that's sort of the difference between grit ideology and, and deficit ideology. Now, the problem with grit ideology, two major problems. One is marginalized people are already the most resilient and gritty people. I mean, think about 
people who are in poverty and still finding a way to make it to school every day. They're the models of resilience and grit. So the argument that we fix people of color or that we fix immigrants, the people who are already have the most difficulties bearing upon them and are still showing up. So they're already the most gritty and resilient people that what we need to do is teach them grit and resilience. That's just backward thinking. That's a very deficit view. Uh, the other problem, of course, is that we're still ignoring the structural inequality. We're saying we're going to go ahead and leave all of these barriers in place and we're just going to help you overcome the barriers that you should never even be experiencing to begin with. It's a very privileged view of how to address inequity. It's I'm going to leave all my privilege in place and then I'm going to help you overcome the fact that you don't have the same privilege that I have. Very privileged view. So the third view is the structural ideology, and this is what I'm going to challenge us to get to. Structural ideology is a recognition of all those barriers. So we sit down and we say, what are the barriers that, that migrants, that refugees experience in our school district? Uh, what are the barriers they experience outside of our school district that impact their experience in our school district? And then also, what are the barriers they experience in our school district? And then our job through the structural ideology is about eliminating those barriers, because that's what equity and justice is. It's about, it's about eliminating the inequity and in, in the injustice. So the one part of that is feels sort of a little bit more controllable, which is what are the barriers that they experience in the system that I'm working in or that I'm running? Because we can change policy and we can change practice to do that. And we must do that. If we don't, if we're not changing policy and practice to make it more equitable, then what we ha are left with is inequity and injustice through a grit approach or through a deficit approach. The more challenging part might be, well, there are these bigger conditions that exist outside of our school or outside of our school district or our university that's impacting students. And that might feel like it's a little bit outside of our sphere of influence. For instance, as an individual teacher, I can't, guarantee, I can't provide computer and internet access to all of my students. I can't buy a car for all of the families who don't have access to transportation. Right? But I can think about when I'm developing policy and practice, I can think, okay, within my sphere of influence, how can I develop policy and practice that will take into account all of the uh, inequalities that are experienced by this uh, particular group of people? So really quickly, I'm going to use one sort of case study example. I'm going to go through the ideologies and, and just demonstrate for you how this works. So for instance, in a lot of places I've been all over the world, one of the things people talk about is that low-income parents don't show up to school uh, to, to engage with the school at the same rates that middle-class or wealthier parents show up and engage uh, with the school. And uh, there's some people have done research some of this research is in question now, but some people have done research that show that it's important for parents to engage uh, with their kids' uh, learning. But the problem is, how do I, the, the question when it comes to ideology is, I can start with this fact. It is a fact, at least in the U.S. context, it's a fact. It's been measured a hundred different ways. Low-income parents do not show up at the same rate as their wealthier peers for school-sponsored, on-site opportunities for family engagement. Of course, there's other research that shows that at home, low-income parents are just as involved in their kids' education as wealthier parents. But let's take this example of on-site, in-school opportunities for family engagement, the fact that low-income parents, on average, don't show up as much for that. The question for me, and this is why ideology is so important, is how do I interpret that? Because how I interpret that completely guides how, I, guides how I respond to it. If I interpret that through a deficit ideology, my immediate response is they don't care. Those parents do not care enough to, uh, to engage with their kids' schools, and that's why they're not showing up. Of course, uh, that's 
a clear example of a, of a privileged, very deficit view to go straight to they don't care. I'm ignoring all kinds of structural inequalities. I'm ignoring the fact that low-income parents are much more likely to be working multiple jobs. They're much more likely to be working evening jobs when these events usually happen. They're much less likely to have transportation. They're much less likely to be able to afford childcare. They're much less likely to have the types of jobs that will give them the time flexibility to come to the school. If you look at intersection with language, they're more likely to be recent migrants or immigrants who don't speak the dominant language. So there are all these barriers. They're also more likely than their wealthier peers to have experienced school as a hostile environment, making it culturally difficult to go in. They might not, uh, so all of these barriers that exist. The problem is if I'm looking through that ideology and I'm ignoring all of that stuff, the solution I might imagine might be something like, well, we need to get all these low-income parents here and, and convince them that they should care more about their kids' education. Now I've just made two big mistakes. One, I've spent resources trying to deal with a problem that doesn't exist because all of the research that's been done for the last couple decades shows that all parents care about their kids' education low-income parents, middle-class parents, working-class parents, wealthy parents, they all care about their kids' education. So that's not the problem. Secondly, because they already care, I've just offended the most marginalized parents in my school system, which is the last thing that I should want to do. Okay, so, uh, so that's the problem with deficit ideology. It takes us to solutions that have nothing to do with the problem uh, and uh, keeps us in that bind. If I have the grit ideology, I might recognize the parents have these problems, but my response is going to be, what I need to do is make the students more resilient or gritty against the fact that their parents can't come to school. The problem with that is that it keeps me out of this structural view of asking, well, how might we do parent engagement differently to make it more accessible to families that don't have access to transportation and childcare? So it really stunts our ability to, to respond to this in ways that are about changing what we do rather than and to ask questions about whether we do things in equitable ways, rather than saying, how do we make the children, how do we make the students more gritty and resilient against the fact that we refuse to do things in more equitable ways? So that's the problem with grit ideology. Structural ideology might say, well, hey, we can't buy every family a car, but, what, but maybe there is something we could do differently. How can we adjust what we're doing to respond to the structural reality that marginalized families are experiencing. Perhaps we could pro help provide transportation, send around a bus. Maybe we can go into low-income communities instead of, uh, instead of expecting them to come to us all the time. Maybe, maybe we can uh, offer on-site childcare. Maybe we could be much more flexible with timing, with how we time these events. Maybe we can make sure that everybody in the school has had adequate training so that they don't, so that uh, when low-income parents do come into school, they're treated with respect and they're treated with dignity so they don't feel like the school is a hostile environment. So that's the trick with, with structural ideology. We start by saying, are we responding to the structural realities within our sphere of influence? Are we, are we eliminating the structural barriers and in that way creating a more equitable and just opportunity uh, for all students. So my challenge to you as a measuring stick is to say, okay, with our policy and our practice initiatives that are about responding to outcome inequalities like dropout rates or whatever it is, are we taking a deficit view that's about fixing marginalized people, or are we taking a structural view, which is about committing to fixing the conditions that marginalize people? So that's the challenge I want to leave with you today. Uh, thank you for listening, uh, and enjoy uh, the rest of your day. Bye-bye.